Good afternoon, everyone. We are so glad to be with you. I am Dr. Jacqueline King, the founder uh, and CEO of Black Women Empowered, a social media ministry network um, with millions of followers. But today, we have lovely Dr. Joyce Haddon, who is also the mother of Dietrich Haddon and Loretta Haddon and all of her beautiful children, all of her beautiful, talented children. And she's going to talk to us today about domestic violence. And um, one of the things that, that concerns me is that with, uh, with everybody being locked in, um, they say that the domestic violence rate has, has gone up. So Dr. Haddon, first of all, can you introduce yourself? Well, I'm Dr. Joyce Hatton, and I'm excited about being with you, uh, Dr. Jackie. It is a pleasure. I know that your audience are people that are awaiting answers and have dealt with some things that maybe we might be able to speak to. And if I can, I promise you, I will. And I know that. That's one of the things that we love, we love about you. Um, you're transparent. You keep it real. So, um, so... And I know that you uh, actually have been a victim of domestic violence yourself. So can you tell us, how, how did you get in that situation and how did you get out? Well, I was very, very young. And, you know, a lot of girls, young girls, fall in love with the wrong person. We don't check into who that person is, uh, you know, their background. Later on, I find out that there's... Uh, horrible issues in the family have been, he had been abused. And most time, most of the time, people that have been abused, abuse others. It's almost something that like, uh, it, it, it just happens. It's almost generational. It, uh, my, my mama beat me and my daddy was horrible to me and it just keeps going. So, you know, I, I'm sure that's why scripture tells us that we should you know, uh, be careful how we, you know, that we should connect with people that are the same like faith and, and desire the same kind of person. And then that's why mama said, leave that dodo, okay, alone. <laughs> She'd look at him and, you know, mothers could come in, they'd look at him and say, not him, you know, and, and we would usually already liking him and you think that that's it, you fall in love quick. You know, because he'd have said some things, and 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 daddy, if daddy's not home, you didn't have a father that talked and told you you were cute, and that, you know. So somebody tell you that, and then all of a sudden you in you know over heels in love with a special kind of dodo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and we thought we knew everything, didn't we? At that age, you were sure that you knew way more than the other person trying to tell you something. It's funny. So, so Dr. Hannon, did you have children? Um, and, and how long did it take before you decided you wanted to leave or you were ready to leave? Because one of my, one of my biggest um, questions is, you know, why do women stay in abusive relationships? I have never been able to figure that out. I know sometimes it's for financial security. But what makes a woman stay in a situation like that? I, I, it varies according to the situation. Um, mine was I had gotten in church, and I had these, you know, the Gerald and and, De, and Dietrich uh, were there. It was their father, and I was in that. And of course, um, the church taught us that there was no divorce. You're not going to divorce and you are a minister, you're going to stay in this. And so I would always say to my pastor, I'd tell him what I was dealing with. Uh, I, I kept it private. I wasn't going through my church telling, oh, I'm being abused. And, but I would talk to, her, to them. If something would get, sometimes it would get really bad with the beatings and the losing of the place to live. And um, that happened way, way before the children. And, but then I think that when I, I, the children came. I made a decision. I remember sitting in a window, looking out, looking out of the window one day, looking ahead, and I felt like there's no way in the world 
I'm the steward. God has made me the person to take care of these children. They'll die with me. Because the way he would do things, it was possible. In fact, he had picked up Gerald. You know, Gerald is Gerald is um, and D and Dietrich are ten months apart. So Gerald Gerald is the MD for Mary Mary. Gerald is the producer and writer for major major major. So you know, I had to protect these. I didn't know who they were going to be then, but I know. You know, they're awesome. They're. I mean, he's been minister of music for Bishop Noel Jones for fifteen years. Rent every piece of music that came out of Refuge, my my son did it. He was a, he's a profound gift. So these were kids that were you could see it on them. You could see these children were gifted. But I knew that if I stayed, he'd been beating me. But he picked Gerald up and walked through a, a glass door. Mm -hmm. And when he walked through the glass door and came through it, and Gerald was okay, I realized. The time was up mm. and I had to get with the get-go. That's what my mother said. <laughs> she said, you get out of this. I've heard you say that before. Well, <laughs> um, so were your kids affected by it? I mean, that they all came out brilliantly talented, but they had to have, it had to have some effect on the kids. Um, this, this, he never really had anything. So I'm in church and they say, you can't marry again. There's no way in your world you can divorce. He was so bold that one day, and he, he was always gone. He'd be home a month, gone three months, home a month, gone weeks and weeks and days. So um, finally he had been gone and uh, he came back to the church that day, early morning service. And he said, he just got up out of the bed with his wife. That's what he said to my church. You know how they testify? Mm -hmm. He says, I just, my wife and I just got, uh, got up. And I said, I want to bring you over to see my wonderful church where the anointing falls. He said that in front of my pastor. Yeah. And my pastor said, you know what? You are the freest person in this room. He says, you don't have to be, you're not tied to anything or anyone. That freed me up. Then immediately I started, went on with my life. I lived with my sister for about a year in her basement my, and my two babies. And I was always just in prayer. I moved across the street from there. And within a year to two years, I met Bishop Clarence Haddon. He was not Bishop then. He was a pastor, and he had just started pastoring on the I, on um, on the north end, which was I seventy five. And I had been dreaming. Listen to me, I had been dreaming of this person that looked like my husband. I would have visions. This is real, and I could I could see him. This man was gifted. This man could sing. This man could preach. That I would see. I would see a man coming into my life, putting me in a house. I saw children. Mm -hmm. The house looked like it was a block long and a bunch of children in it. And I would, it, this man and I would sit in the back of a limousine and I could see us driving through a city or driving through some big. And do you know that it wasn't, but it might have been two years I met him. I, when I met him, I saw the man I had been dreaming about, and I knew he was my husband. He invited me to a service. I went, and with the, the, the second day, I recognized him, and I knew he was my husband, but I wasn't about to say that. <laughs> I wasn't going to say, oh, you're my husband, <laughs> the man I've been seeing. But I knew it. I knew it without a shadow of a doubt. And God blessed me with him. So Bishop Clarence Haddon has been in my life since my children were two and three. Dietrich was two and Jerry was three. So, so how did you, I mean, how did you get out of, away from this other man? Well, when he walked through the glass door with Gerald, 
I realized it was time was up. Um, I said, but I had said to the Lord, I've been praying. And I really believe that people that are dealing with those kind of things, I suggest that you be prayerful. I suggest that you have a mindset to, so, that you can, so that you can get direction. You need to hear what's next. When, uh, when your heart is involved, it's hard to break away from somebody you love, you've, you're involved with. It's, it's emotional. It's, uh, uh, it's so many emotions going on. But the Lord helped me in prayer. I believe that, and I was always fasting and praying. He helped me in prayer. Looking out that window, I remember looking out the window and saying, he'll kill my children. He'll kill me and my children. It's one thing for him to kill me, but he won't be able to kill these babies. I got them. So I've been praying. My brother-in-law that night came. He and my brother came and picked me up. And I was directed to get all the things. I had planned, I'm not leaving no more. I'm not going, uh, I can't take it. I ain't leaving. I don't care what he does. But that night I left and I never looked back. It happened with me looking through the window, mm -hmm. saying it's not about me mm -hmm. and what I feel and what I want. It was about those babies. Mm -hmm. I left for them so that they would live. Yeah, you were you were very brave and very bold. Um, I remember a classmate of mine who um, put her husband out, and um, and what happened was uh, he came back and he killed him. He came back and strangled her to death in front of her children. Um, you know, those restraining orders, I mean, I don't, I've never had one, but they're not worth the paper that they're written on, because they don't mean to do that. Wow. Well, we, I had a lot of uh, interaction. Before the leaving for, sh for good, I had so many of them, it was unreal. I'd go home. I, I would go to, I'd run to, back to mama's house. I would go to uh, uh, a friend, somebody, some person in the church. Uh, always hiding, always running. He'd come and find me. He was also, he, he had another life. Because even after, you know, we did Preachers of L.A. I don't know if you saw Preachers of L.A. But Dietrich is the, Dietrich was the uh, originator of Preachers of L.A. And so our family was involved in a lot of things that of my past was involved. And so some of the children of his, uh, uh, of his past were a part of the preachers of LA. And I remember even a, when he was always involved with women. So there was always some girl, some woman pregnant, somebody else, somebody he brought by the house, mm. crazy stuff, you know? So he wasn't, he had some, he had other interests. Mm. So he would beat me when he thought, when I wasn't doing, you know, wasn't where he, or I think that he also had issues with, some people are sick, you know, they're not all well. <laughs> some men are, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking he had uh, Agent Orange, he had gone to, mm. had gone to, um, uh, to the army. PTSD. He, he, he took medicine and mm. he had a doctor that would give him a prescription. And when he didn't have that, it looked like he was worse. Mm. He couldn't get a hold of whatever it is that they would give him. Or when he got a hold to it, maybe he was worse. He was missing something, whether he had too much of it or didn't have enough. So I had so, a lot of issues. Here's one of the, the biggest issues because we have dealt with domestic violence for a long time, BWE. And um, one of the things I found, and you know, you and I did a show on it um, what, a few years, quite a few years ago, but the shelters, mostly them are, are all full. I mean, there's really no place to go in most cases. What, what, what do you suggest? I mean, what do you tell somebody? They can't go to their family. They can't go to the shelter. So many of the women are just stuck 
Uh, they feel like they have no choice but to stay there and take it. And a lot of them, like you said, finance, financial. Uh, I'm going to suggest to women to make your own life, even with a man. Mm -hmm. Don't ever be without some money. Always have some kind of income. If you're given, if, if maybe you don't work, I would suggest you get a job. I, you know, waiting on a man to come and buy me something. Let me tell you something. I, I, I'm, I'm not. I don't. I'm not a bolster. But no, I don't wait for him to buy me a coat. I buy my own. I buy my own coat. My own. I want to be fabulous. I'm my own fabulous. You know what I'm saying? You didn't buy. I, I bought my own car. I, you know what I'm saying? He could buy it. If, if And thank you, honey. And I appreciate it because my husband's really good to me. But don't ever be stuck where you're waiting on somebody to do something, but to give you some kind of allowance. And mm -hmm. if you get an allowance, hide half of it. Put it somewhere. So if you ever have to run, <laughs> leave. <laughs> It's some kind of spirits on people that make them controlling demon or something that will sure. abuse you. It's wonderful to have a good man, but then at the you know that then they're always it's something. What triggers? What would ever trigger? God bless the child that has her. Uh... <laughs> That's what I say. And let me tell you something. Probably the worst and more abused people are church in church. Because we put everything on God. What is, we, we need to stay for God. We need to stay for the spirit realm. We need to stay to be spiritual. God don't want. And I think that we put too much on, somebody's lying on God. Because God didn't mean for that girl to be killed. She, God don't want me to leave. But she died doing God's will. Come on. Yeah. No, I don't believe that some of these things are to be put on God. God, God loves you. And, and you must have uh, self-esteem. You should, you should know who you are and, and how much you're loved, you're blessed, and how favored you are, and how you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, you just, you're, you're awesome. I did a book on uh, the priceless woman. I did it on purpose. You're valuable. You're so in fact, uh, the, the, that king comes and stands on the border of his, of his uh, castle or his place and looks over and he's dealing and he's dealt with all kind of women, every kind of woman that you could deal with. He done dealt with them all. And he says, who can find? A virtuous woman. For her price is above rubies. You're a bad sister. Okay. If you are, I cold. if you've got God and got yourself together, baby, hey, reach above your cut place, your wound, your place, your pain. Reach above your place, your hurt, and know who you are and get past anything that's wounded you. I've decided, you know, I got to a place where I was like, if I get stabbed in the back, I'm going to massage it and say, oh, thank you. <laughs> Keep it moving, baby. I, will, I refuse to die by the hand of the enemy. You know what I'm saying? And you make a, yeah, you make a very valid point. Um, one thing that I can, I, I can thank my late mother for was instilling in me independence. Um, <laughs> It is, it's, it's, you know, it's good to have a good man, um, you know, that's oh, got your taking care of you and all that. Yes. But, I love it. So I, I saw a show, I believe it was Dr. Phil, where a woman, she didn't even know how to write a check. He controlled everything. That's a bad place to be. When he left, she didn't know, she didn't know how to do anything. She didn't know how to pay a bill. She didn't know, she didn't know how to do anything. That's a bad place to be. Well, or if he dies, if he die, mm -hmm. you know, he could die. Uh, yeah. And then you know nothing. Uh, one of the worst things is to be, 
to be subject and have no clue about who you are and now what you're going to do in life. You should, you should be fulfilled. There are so many unfulfilled people waiting for somebody to fulfill them, to make them whole. You got to be whole. Uh, two halves. <laughs> There's some split between the two halves. <laughs> you need to be whole and he need to be whole. And when you meet him, you come together as whole people. So vile. So you can be, you can be so destroyed uh, depending on other people for your life. I could tell you some stories because, of course, you know that we pastor. And we've been doing it 40-something years, almost 45. And every kind of thing that can happen in ministry, we've, we've dealt with it because we don't just deal with our own church. We have two. But we deal with people all over the world, you know. And we, we have uh, people with issues and, and stories and first ladies. We have to deal with pastors and their women or their 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 wives and so we have to we deal we i mean it's a lot of hurting people and hurting people hurt people hurting people hurt people that's just the way it is if you're wounded you wound you messing with you messing up somebody else so be healed i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna switch up on you because i know there's a lot of first ladies let me go to the first ladies now that Stay in abusive relationships, and it might not necessarily be physical abuse. It could be verbal abuse. It could be emotional abuse. But they stay because they like the limelight. Am I telling the truth? I, I think that some stay because of the limelight. Some stay because of embarrassment. They wouldn't want to embarrass some, but then some stay for ministry. And what and what i'm saying what i'm saying about that is they stay because they feel as though it would destroy so many people you know that, that you'd be shocked to how many people stay how many people they feel as though they would destroy if this church was broken up or messed up and that they found out that the pastor was special because <laughs> they're not the verbal abuse is one of the largest i think when it comes to leaders if they they're angry, they they talk any kind of way to their to their women, uh, um, wives, and they and here's what I hate is to see a man that treats all the other women wonderful. Oh, he's just oh, and he, oh, Miss Sister Jones, oh that beautiful hat you have on, oh mm -hmm. you're so beautiful, and he's just bragging on every other woman, and you can tell that he never brags on her. Yep. That's a problem. So, so <laughs> what is your advice to them? I mean, because you have to be able to, I mean, you can't, I can't, I can say for me, I don't see me staying. <laughs> I don't see me staying for the church. The church will have to fall apart. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let the church go on. Let the church say amen. Yeah, I know. You can't, I can't go down that road with you. I can't cover it up. Um, but, but, know. but a lot, when I tell you most, probably 70% of the women that are being abused in a church, I plan to do something on, uh, with first ladies. I'd like to have a show that just deals with first ladies. I'd like to have a talk show and I'd like to bring all of the first ladies and we talk. Can we talk? And just share. Because, and, and, and there are some that really will tell. And there are some that will tell what they dealt with. We need a show on that. Dr. King, we need something. We can make that, we can make that happen. But Let's make know, that happen. We, we need to just keep on talking about it because I think there's a lot of black women, women of color that hide it. Um, you know, they, you know, they don't want to talk about it. And there's men too. There's men, men get abused too. Abused men. Don't... Huh? Oh, it's I've a... seen abused men. They slap them around. I've seen women slap their men. <laughs> men treat them. Shut up. Shut your pie hole. <laughs> I've 
have seen it. God knows. Oh. But you know, and and you know, brothers, brothers they ain't they gonna go around talking about my, my wife slapped me. You already know that. that <laughs> she beat me up last night. <laughs> but it's so, real. It is real. What what can you say to the men? Well, I would encourage them to become a man, to become the man of their house. And because if he, as long as he allow her to do that, she will. It, it's something that she saw probably in her own personal life, her mother and father. You know, you almost mimic what happens in your house. My children always say to uh, my husband, you are a good father. And I want you to think about uh, Bishop Hatton was is Dietrich and Gerald's and Zena's stepfather, but they love him like a father. It, it, it's it's how the woman handles. It's how I treated him, and it's how I caused them to respect and to look at him. He was always such a good father, and and I treated because we have mine his and ours that's a whole different show <laughs> you know that because it can be very serious if you don't know how um, to blend a family it can be very devastating it can be chronic jealousy it can be hard so it's a whole different thing i, I would suggest to them to, to a man that was being abused by his woman to flip I wouldn't beat her. But I'd act like Celie in color purple. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> One more. <laughs> I'd do it to the man that was doing treat. I, in fact, if Bishop ever, because sometimes he's not as, um, you know, the older you get, the more busy you get. People are busy. And they might try to raise their voice. I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> I will do that for you. I don't mind doing that for you. But there will be respect. I, know that. I mean, because what we, I started, my mother was, uh, my mother had eight children. My daddy was in the army. So my father only came once a year, sometimes twice. But later on in years, we found he could have come way more. He had another family. I have a sister that is one month older than I am. Same, well, she was born in January. I was born in February, almost the same date. I had two brothers. And since I've met them, both of the brothers have died. But I have a sister that I talk and communicate with all the time. We were, I, I was born in Fort Bragg, and Fayetteville was right down the road, about a mile or so. And he had a family down, down the street. When my mother found out that he had uh, another situation going on down, down there, she took all of us uh, and went home to her mother back to Alabama. So I know what it is to pick cotton. <laughs> We went to we went to Alabama and lived there until uh, we lived in Alabama until I was like five. My oldest brother worked for uh, one of the sharecroppers or whoever you call those people. And it was a big cotton field. And my brothers and sisters worked there. And even myself, I did for a, a small time. We picked cotton. And in that, my brother fell out with, with he had a friend, the man that owned it. With his son was a friend of my brother's, and one day they fell out. They he began to curse my my brother, and my brother was you know we were taught independence, and and my brother called him. He called him and what you call black people, and he called him what you call what you call the crackers. And so you won and you won too. And and he says as long as my brother and my brother got his goat, you know what you call him, got him and made him mad. He went home and told his father, James called me a cracker. James called me, you know, uh, names. And so he came to my mother's house. 
uh, that evening and said to my mother, James and John are friends, but James cannot call John a cracker and all these names. Well, mama said, James told me that John called him a nigger and John called him a black, a black one. And James called him this and that. So she says, and he says, well, it won't happen again. And you teach James that he is, he works for me and they're friends, but he will not be calling John names. My mother said he will not be calling James John names because James won't be working for you. The next two days, my family, my mother's brother and sister-in-law came to pick all of us up and we moved to Detroit. We moved to the East Side. <laughs> We're going, yes. So your father wasn't abusive. He just had other women. Other it's women. the same. He, he acted like a, he was a lover. My father was, uh, he had charisma. My father was, he had something special that drew women. And oh my God. So until I was 16 years old, my mother expected my father to come home till she got a letter saying that he was getting married to a, to an E5, my, my stepmother, and he was moving to, to Chicago and uh, told my mother that he wouldn't, he wasn't coming home, but he was getting married and moving on. I still loved my daddy and we, I, I visit my father until he died. But he, so he wasn't abusive. He wasn't physically. But then, I don't know, what would you call the, the allotment that comes once a month to a woman that has eight children? The allotment is not all, it's like a, kind of like what you would call, I don't know, it's a check. And every now and then he'd ask her for it, a part of it. To me, that was a kind of abuse. Well, I mean, having another another family. <laughs> it, it, well, she, I'm, I'm sure. I, I just found that out five years ago. Mm -hmm. And when we found out that he had another family, they found us. It wasn't somebody just finding us. You could see it. She looks... They look like my daddy spit them out. Mm -hmm. They were my father's children. Um, he had other children. He was in the army. They encouraged that. <laughs> he had a yeah. child over in London, so in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, you know, back on on on. Bam. <laughs> So we're gonna wrap it up in a, in a little bit, but I just want to give encouragement to all these women who are stuck in the house with these men because of the quarantine or whatever reason, and um, they just have to sit there and take it. Well, and it's really active right now, activated. It, it's extreme. Because there's a, a lot of angry, angry anger, and a lot of times people weren't used to used to being together. They've been going to work, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, they're home every day. And now you realize this person has a nasty way about them, mm -hmm. and it's ugly. Don't know how to talk to you. You don't like them. It's a lot of that going on. You didn't realize what kind of person it was because every day, all you have to do is cook for them. That you didn't know how they interact, even with the children. They're screaming now that the children, they're walking through slamming doors. They go out now, come back when they get ready. And you weren't used to that. Now you see something. Now you see it. Now you don't. Look at what you see. I'm going to suggest that you open your eyes, recognize where you are, and do something about it. What I do is I, I was always a praying person. I believe God can do anything. But then you got to be wise. If it's dangerous, if you know you're in danger, do some, don't you wait. So I'm going to wait till he, uh, well, when he hurt me, no. 
if you if he's saying I'll kill you, you better get yourself up. Uh, let me tell you something. Get you a bag. And what you do, here's 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 what you do. You do what I tell you. You get you a bag, you put your toothpaste and your all your stuff and you some overnight stuff. And you get mama said, what I tell you, my mama said, get with the get go. <laughs> you get out of there before it's too late and then handle it from somewhere else sometimes the man is 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 valuable but he's got going through something too but if you know he'll handle you and choke he'll touch and be then don't wait till he kill you go i command you to go i command strength in you i command you to be strong enough to get up and recognize that you are better than that, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and that God has chosen you for something special. And you got to live past this pandemic, and you got to live past the pandemic. Here's what I say, Doctor. Doctor, I said the pandemic and the pandemic. <laughs> the pandemic is the is the damage that the devil is doing to try to destroy you. The demic is that virus, but the virus that has handled and mishandled you is dam uh, is damic. Mm -hmm. It's not of God. We damn it in Jesus' name, and we say, "Get up and live, and not die." You've been well, chosen I'm, to live. I'm going to ask you to <laughs> close us out in prayer because I know you're a praying woman. Yes. And uh, we will have this available to all of our followers. It'll be on our YouTube channel, and um, we'll have it load, uh, uploaded to Instagram and all of our sites. So they'll be able to watch it over and over again. Um, and they can see you every Tuesday on our platform at uh, 7, which is your time. And then talk about your, um, your midnight drop. Oh, thank you so much for that, Dr. Jack. Um, every night. I've been doing it for almost three months. And, and from 11 until 12, uh, every single night, it's called Midnight Drop. We have some of the most profound, gifted. I've had doctors on. I've had preachers, prophets, evangelists, teachers. Uh, God leads me to what will, be, will happen per week. And... Uh, so sometimes we're, we're dealing in the area of healing, and sometimes we're dealing in the prophetic. Prophets, I bring on prophets, and basically every night people are prof prophesied to or got a word from the Lord, or we're going in a different way. So it's, it's a mixture of hearing from God. I'm so excited about it. Last night we had a, a young senator on, um, uh, forgive me for us, uh, Sabrina, she's in, in uh, politics, but she was anointed and powerful, powerful woman of God that's dealing in the political arena and traveling saying, muzzle not the ox that treaded out the corn, that it's time to speak up and say it till you see it. I believe that you should open your mouth and say it till you see the manifestation. So the phone number, should I give it? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, 605-472-5300, uh, and uh, the code is 535-199-POUND, and tonight we have all the way up, we call him, he's a man of God, he's, one of, he's a powerful young man that came from the street, is a, was a rapper, but God is using him now in a pr very profound way, a preacher, and he is, his name is Levi. And at one time he was out there, but now God has blessed his life. It's going to be awesome. Yes. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Joyce, my, my queen. Um, you know, I love you and I appreciate you. Yes. And, um, the only thing we're going to do is go up. Um, if you can just. Well, let me speak over you. Let me speak something concerning you because you're special, unique, and outstanding. And, and you need to hear that sometimes, that God has handpicked and chose you for such a time as this, that what God is doing in the shifting, I want to encourage those women that are connected and those that God is planning something bigger than us.
It is, it, it is so planned by God that you can't afford to get distracted or miss it. You've been anointed for the future. So it's like God is, I, I was telling the people of God how I saw like the Red Sea. Imagine this, being right there and the water on one side and the water on the other side and you're standing in between and the hand of God is the one that's pushing it and keeping it back from you. Women that are going through women that have been hurt and going through pain god's going to take you from pain to power oh yes the enemy is behind you it's a pharaoh but in the name of jesus decree and declare this your ground is dry and you will not sink because god has made your ground dry i say that for the people of god that is connected with you dr uh jacqueline king queen king <laughs> you're yeah. queen king Yes, God bless yes. you. I love you and appreciate you so much. Thank you. Oh, I you and, I, and we're so glad that you're on the, on the platform. Um, it's just, it's a blessing. And, and uh, Claretta, and we're going to get, we're going to get Dietrich on y'all. Um, Dr. I was Dr. just talking to him a day and I'm talking to him about it. Yes. Yeah, we're going to get him on. He, he has a new song out that we're going to be, we're going to be promoting. So, but, um, God bless everyone. We thank you again for um, for coming on. Dr. Joyce will be back on her regular platform uh, next Tuesday at 7. And again, um, be sure to follow us on all our social media sites. We, uh, our LinkedIn page, we just hit 40,000 followers, and that's a new page, so that's a blessing. Uh, we have 73, 75, I don't remember, 1,000 on Pinterest. Uh, 67,000 on Instagram and millions on Facebook. So you can follow us on all our social media platforms. We have some big things coming up. And until the next time, God bless you. Love you. Good night.